Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Change Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, Chris Ashley, where we explore the intersection between personal development, spirituality, and science. And I'm really excited. Today, we are going to talk about how to prepare for the more stressful aspects of the holiday season. And that's something I think we could all relate to. We have an expert coming on. I'm so excited to hear what she has to say. Hi, I'm Chris. When I was younger, I went through trauma that caused me to feel broken and lost. But my life changed after I had a spiritual awakening. Since then, I've dedicated my life to studying and learning from masters all around the world that have helped me to create a life of fulfillment and abundance beyond my wildest dreams. Now I'm dedicated to sharing everything I've learned so that you don't have to suffer for decades like I did. I've seen people's lives completely transform, and I share it all right here. First, a couple quick announcements. Head over to the links in the show notes. You'll find a link to my book, Change Your Mind to Change Your Reality. It was endorsed by Bob Doyle, Michael Beckwith, Marcy Shimoff, John Gray. Uh, I've also got tons of free giveaways and those links down there, ways to with me to find my courses, my coaching. So please come stay connected. All right. So I am so excited today. I have with me Florence Ann Romano. And Florence Ann is a personal growth strategist, an author, and a philanthropist. After spending more than 15 years as a child care provider, Florence Ann, formerly known as the Windy City Nanny, is the authority on child care and family and village support in this new millennium. Born and raised just outside of Chicago, she wants to show people that not only is the saying it takes a village true, but also how important the need for community is. Her latest book is Build Your Village, a guide to finding joy and community in every stage of life. So welcome, Florence Ann. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for a very kind and warm introduction. And I'm very excited about this subject matter because I think everyone's figuring out how to deal with the holidays and as merry and bright as they can be, there's some challenges with that too. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, we didn't even get a chance to talk about this before the show. I'm also from Chicago originally. So what oh. what part did you grow up in? Hinsdale. I born and raised and I lived in the city for a long time but now have moved back to my hometown of Hinsdale. What about you? Nice. I grew up uh, Do you know where Evanston is? Oh, of course. Yeah. I grew up like 10 minutes from Evanston on the north side in the suburb. Oh beautiful up there. You've got the lake and all that beautiful property. Oh my gosh, how fun. Well, I got a Midwest girl, so we already have so much in common. Yeah, absolutely. So (laughs) always sniff one out the same way they say, like you see a New Yorker, you know, or it's like a New York, kind of tell the same thing about a Midwestern person. Absolutely. For sure. Um, So, you know, I always start my shows the same way. And that is by asking uh, my guests what their origin story is. What led you to this line of work? What made you the expert on creating a village. I'd love to hear your story. Well, let's take it back to where it really all began. And that's when uh, I was a nanny for over 15 years. You had mentioned the Windy City Nanny. Uh, I was a beautiful time in my life. I had written a children's book regarding child care in the new millennium called Nanny and Me, taught children how uh, about the transition of being cared for by their parents to being cared for by uh, a caretaker of some kind. Because the statistic at that time was over 65% of families in America had a caretaker. And I was like, gosh, this is really part of our culture today. And I started to do a lot of media regarding child care in the new millennium. Uh, and that was wonderful. And I loved it. Um, and then as the years went on, you know, we all of a sudden got COVID uh, in our world and globally. And uh, I started paying attention to what a lot of parents were saying, which was, it takes a village to raise a child. Where is this village? Is there a phone number to call or the directions to it? They would bemoan this all the time. I thought to myself, gosh, you know, really, we really should have directions to the village. These people don't just show up at your front door. We really should talk about how does this work? So during COVID, I decided to write the directions to the village. And that's what uh, ended up becoming my book, Build Your Village, A Guide to Finding Joy and Community in Every Stage of Life. I wanted to not only constantly concentrate on that proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. I wanted to cut it in half and say, it takes a village. Because what if you don't have kids? Mm -hmm. Then does that mean you don't deserve to find your people? That means you don't deserve a community? Well, the answer is, of course you deserve it. No matter what you're born into, you deserve to be able to find your people and build that community for yourself. So I created six villagers in my book, six archetypes that you identify with. Uh, And now I'm very lucky to be able to be in this 
personal growth capacity uh, and get to talk to people about this village building concept and how to apply it to their lives, no matter the season of life that they're in. I, I thank you for sharing. Uh, I, I love that. And I relate to it in so many ways. First of all, I'm eight months pregnant. So oh. I'm, I'm like waiting for that village. Right? Or I'm, I'm trying to build that village around me. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to check out your first book. Um, I will send it to you. You do not need to go to, I will send it to you. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Even yeah. better. Um, but I love that you focus on all areas of life because it, sometimes it's hard to make friends as an adult, especially right. if you're moving to a new city or starting a new job or working right. from home now, right? That's right. a huge thing after the pandemic. So, well, we're also in a an epidemic of loneliness here in our country mm -hmm. today, and our mental health is really being affected by that. You know, we're in a mental health crisis, and we saw that exacerbated by COVID. And what's interesting about that is we're not really seeing the recovery now that we've come out of COVID. We're seeing this mental health crisis perhaps get worse. And uh, one of the other sides to my life philanthropy wise is they sit on a board at Sesame Street and Sesame Street has been educating children and families for over 50 years and their emphasis right now above anything else content wise is mental health with children and emotional well-being and so you know anywhere you slice it whether it's an adult or a child we need to pay attention to how we're connecting with one another and how that perhaps is um suffering in, in so many different capacities. And this idea of village and community, what does that look like for you? Because it doesn't look the same for everybody. And so being open-minded about that is also a really important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. And it makes sense that it's it's getting worse. Like it feels like people are really isolated now. Uh, we're behind our screens a lot. Like I said, people right. are working from home a lot. Um, I hear parents talk about screen time all the time. Like when I was a kid, I was out riding my bike and didn't come home till dark. Right? Right. <laughs> Me, same thing. Yeah, same yeah. thing. I mean, uh, think about that though, because I mean, the pressures uh, that children have today, and this is a whole different rabbit hole we can go down with social media and just kind of the content that they're digesting. There's a lot of influence that's happening. And I, I use children as an example. However, we are, as adults, are not exempt to it. Think about us on social media. We're yeah, we're looking at all this content. And some days we wake up and we feel so depleted. We feel so less than. And we wonder why. Probably because we're surrounding ourselves with content that is not filling us up in the proper ways that somehow is maybe toxic to us. Um, and so how can we sit there and tell our children to limit their screen time when we as adults can't even take our own advice with that? Um, so I, I think we all have a lot to learn regarding how we are exposing ourselves to the influences um, and how that's actually affecting our mental and emotional health. That is so true. And, and we're going to get to the holiday thing too, but I just, yeah, I know, I know. So oh my this gosh. is like such an important conversation because, you know, every time that I've deliberately taken a break from social media, like usually I'll go on like spiritual retreats sometimes. Like I went to Eckhart Tolle last year and I didn't touch, it was amazing. It was in Hawaii, but I didn't touch my phone for a week. And I just felt at first it was like an addiction. Like I wanted to, but I didn't. And yeah. I just felt so good right. at the end of that week. And then yeah. I noticed as I started looking at it again, it it made me depressed. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you don't realize that it's like when you take a break from caffeine and then you drink coffee again and you're like, oh my God, this is a drug, right? <laughs> it, it, it like really affects you. It's wild. It's, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this last night. It's funny you bring it up. I was, you know, watching a recorded, a movie that I had recorded and I forgot that I recorded it. And every time a commercial came on, I'd pick up my phone and start scrolling. Every time a commercial came on. And I'm like, wait, what am I doing? I can fast forward. But it wasn't even that. It was the fact that every single time a commercial came on, I had to go back on my phone. I had just looked at it about, you know, five minutes before. What am I doing? Why am I so attached to it? And you know, I love what you said that, you know, that detox for you as hard as it was in the beginning, then once you did go back to it, there was this feeling of ickiness associated with it. So what did we learn there from that? We learned that 
removing ourselves from it actively, intentionally, is a really important part of our health and keeping ourselves also peaceful. We're always searching for that peace in all these different ways. And that's a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I do want to talk about the holidays. And I think this is such a good segue to being present, right? Because I mean, there's, you know, and my husband and I are guilty of it all the time. We'll be just hanging out and it's like the phones are always out and it's like, wait, no, let's just be present with each other. Um, But I know the holidays come with so much more stress, uh, just being around family and sensitive topics and establishing boundaries and all of that. So I, I know that you came with some, tips for us. And yes. I'm, I'm so excited to hear about them because, you know, I know I need them this year for the holidays and I'm, I'm sure listeners do too. So tell you us know, a bit about them. Yeah. Right. It's always, there's always, I think a hint of truth, no matter what you're going through in your family as perfect as it may seem as, as harmonious as it is, there's probably a hint of truth to all of this that will resonate with you. And I, I hope it does. Um, and also not to put a, a dark cloud over the holidays, but certainly, um, there's a lot of emotion that go into the holidays. You know, not I, again, I don't want to say anything too melancholy, but you know, think about the people who are going into the holidays and it's their first one without their mom or their dad or their grandparent or a sibling or, and you know, this holiday is going to feel different for them. It's going to look different for them. And we got to we have to give people grace, you know, because that could also influence their behavior. And you never know what people are going through. So just being a little kinder to during this season really is is important. But let's start with this uh, proactive preparation for positive interactions. So, you know, holiday gatherings, there are potential challenges if it's political or religious. Again, we're living through a time right now where there's a lot of really sad things happening in the country. Um, And sometimes It's best to make that environment a no politics, no religion, nothing controversial uh, environment. Uh, And I know that sounds weird that you would make that rule, but I'm going to give you a very recent example. So my parents are divorced. They've been divorced over uh, four years now, but we're married for 40, if you can believe it. Now they have uh, a very good relationship, but my dad comes to all the holidays still. And my dad tends to get very sad during the holidays, you know, ever since the divorce. And so my sisters and I decided, you know what, we're not even going to give an opportunity for just sitting around talking. We'll have the dinner. But then after the dinner, the Thanksgiving dinner, we're going to play a game. So we played a game after dinner for the rest of the time. And we had the best time. We didn't talk about anything anything that was emotional. We didn't bring up anything that was going to be difficult or challenging. It was really very light and bright. And we needed to kind of direct my dad that way uh, in order to make sure that we created that environment again, that was going to was going to be the most positive and most successful. So that's a piece of advice I want to give you. If it's your home, or even if it's not, try to bring to the table something that is going to be positive. And maybe that's you bringing a game to someone's house or everyone making a ground rule that we're not going to talk about anything controversial. Set that as the standard or as the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the thesis statement of the day. Um, take control where you can take control in a situation where maybe you feel very out of control, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. And I think that's a great idea. And I'm just thinking about, you know, Christmas and Hanukkah coming up give a game as a gift, right? Yes. Like even yes. better, right? And then it's and then it's there and it's like, hey, let's play this thing. But I love that, like redirecting people. Um right. and you know, actually I lost my father this year. So my mother is on her, she's actually on a plane right now, coming out for the holidays. So I know that's gonna be a tough one to navigate. So um I like this idea of just having empathy and really kind of just being a little more understanding of people's individual situations. Right. And I'm so sorry for your loss. And it, it is, it is a very, um, it's a, it can be a very hard time, you know, losing people, no matter what is hard, but when it's on the heels of a holiday, uh, and it's the first holiday, perhaps you're spending without them, the first of everything in grief is very difficult. And so, um, 
you know, everyone grieves differently too. So you don't know how that's going to reveal itself in each person. And you don't always know either too, what someone's going through that you might be walking into a Christmas party, a holiday party, or whatever it is that you're attending and don't know what someone's going through. That's why it's important again, to lead with that kind of kindness and give people that grace because not everyone is going to be open about perhaps what they're dealing with personally. Absolutely. And, and that's a lesson we can take beyond the holidays too, yes. right? Like we yes. never know what someone else is going through. Right. And someone, right. people are usually going through something, you know, like Absolutely. life has its challenges. Absolutely. And, you know, that brings up an interesting, t- you know, one of the, the topics here regarding the holidays is, you, you know, people are doing the best that they can. And sometimes the best that they can means that they're establishing boundaries and uh, and they're they're working hard at that. And boundaries, I always joke, Chris, that people say it's like a dirty word. Don't say boundaries to me because people think they're automatically, you're, you're like, offend- I'm doing something offensive to you. So that's why you're using that word boundaries with me. And boundaries is not just to protect me. It's to protect you. It's to protect everybody in the situation. You're not, it's not a selfish word, I guess I'm trying to say. And so holidays are, another really good time to establish those boundaries. And I always say, you can say what you mean without saying it mean. So, you know, I I think people think when you say boundaries, it's aggressive and, uh, you know, it's effective communication. It's being a good listener. It's making an, an, um, an effort to effectively listen without it judging perhaps, or listening to understand, um, and deepening that connection with somebody. I think we live in a world today where communication is attached to a lot of ego Mm -hmm. and that doesn't leave a lot of room for acceptance or even conversation. Talk to me a little more about that, that communication (laughs) is attached to ego because I, I, that perked my interest. Is it that people are just like waiting for the next thing to say rather than really listening? Yes, that, but also I'm so important that everything I say has to be the most important, you know, piece of this conversation. And I can't possibly be wrong about what I'm saying. So I'm not going to even pay attention to what you're saying because I am absolutely right. So it's not, you're not even listening to the other person because it's hard. I think when we're engaging in a conversation where, okay, we already know that we have where we disagree because agreeing to disagree doesn't even work in today's world. We don't even know how to do that anymore. I don't think mm-hmm. we should. I, I'd like to get back to that, but I don't think we do. But when that person is, is so sure of themselves and so cocky, and again, that ego attached to it, where they're not even going to allow that person to share their opinion and also be you be able to try and even see it to even try and see their perspective of it. And I think that there's an art to that. And and that's something that we're not doing as well today, where we could still end the conversation agreeing to disagree, but wouldn't it be great if I learned something and you learned something too from this conversation, even if we're still not going to agree, that we're still going to respect each other enough to learn something and hear something. Um, I think that's what I'm talking about when it comes to ego being attached to communication. It has to do with how important you think you are. Right. And I think that just goes back to empathy, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. to me, empathy is understanding that everyone's life path is just as valid as yours. Yes. Right. Everyone's belief system, everyone's opinions are just as valid as yours are. Absolutely. And, you know, the world would be very boring, of course, if we all, you know, thought the same and, you know, were the same, looked the same, all of that. But um, I really think that it's something that we we need to teach our children. I always say it starts in the sandbox. This is this is stuff that should start in the sandbox. How do you raise your children? Here you are about to become a mommy. You know, I'm sure you think about it. How do I raise my child to be empathetic and tolerant and loving and kind and all of those different things? Well, it starts with our children watching us. It starts, you know, just watching you sit down, sit, sitting down to write a thank you note to someone because they they did something kind for you and seeing the act, that act of, of, of generosity acknowledged. It's making sure that your kids know when you're out in public and maybe you see someone drop something or someone looks like they're struggling with a, um, a, uh, 
a grocery cart. There's a mom who's nice. Well, use your pregnancy because you're pregnant right now. A mom who's pregnant with, you know, and holding one on her hip and trying to put the cart away. And you run up there and you say, let me grab that for you. And you just go right to your car. It's cold outside. It's that kindness, just being thoughtful, living a life in service of others. How can we observe how we can be helpful? Again, this is going down a, a different road, but this time of year is when we really should be paying more attention to those moments. And then hopefully the light of that moment that you learn now during Christmas and Hanukkah and all these beautiful holidays is something that will carry with you the rest of the year. But start now. If you want to start something now that is going to carry you through 2024, start it now. Don't wait for New Year's. I love all those examples. And I think it's so important because not only are you setting an example for your child, but you're you're becoming this beacon, this light for everyone else around you, right? Like acts of kindness are contagious. Right. right. Who's it's, watching you? Who's watching you exactly. in that moment? Yes. And yeah. That and even that person that you did that for, right? Like it right. makes people want to go out and do something kind for someone. Yeah, it really is a ripple effect. And I, I talk about that in my book about the, 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 the ripple effect of being consciously compassionate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's really important in our world, of course, like many other things, but the consciously compassionate part of it you know, just like you pick out your clothes every day, I've heard it said that you need to choose your thoughts the same way you choose your clothes. And, you know, protecting your peace and setting those boundaries and, um, and, and that self care, all of this is is kind of all under that umbrella. But uh, understanding, though, that it's kind of addicting when you do that kindness. And I always say, you know, it, it feels so good to help, but then you feel almost bad that it feels good to help and it shouldn't feel good. It should feel selfless, right? But the truth is, if it feels good like that, it's going to fuel you to keep doing it. You know, most things in life, if, if something feels good, tastes good, sounds good, you're going to want to keep doing that. So if acts of kindness fuels you in that way and warms your heart and continues that ripple effect, then enjoy and embrace the feeling that it gives you, knowing that you're going to keep using that to make that light and that feeling brighter and brighter. So well said. I love that. And along those lines, going back to the holidays mm -hmm. of, you know, just doing things that feel good and spreading some kindness. One of the other points you talk about is letting go of grudges and forgiveness and holidays just seems like the perfect time to do that. So can you talk a little bit about what are your strategies for letting go of grudges and forgiveness? Because a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, I'm going to give you my favorite definition of forgiveness, which is, Forgiveness is giving up the hope that pa the past could be any different. I'm going to say it again. Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different. Mm -hmm. If you subscribe to that philosophy of forgiveness, then a lot of things in life you're going to be able to forgive. Now, do I think that everything deserves forgiveness? Everyone deserves forgiveness? No, I think there's caveats to that probably. However, forgiveness is always going to be for you. It's going to, you know, it's, they always say forgiveness, it, you know, it's like, if you're, if you don't forgive someone and you hold on to that grudge, then it's like you drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Yeah. And so forgiveness is for you. Uh, and forgiveness can take a lot of different forms. I, again, you know, what does that look like? Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean access. Just because you forgive someone doesn't mean they deserve your relate a relationship with you. Um, I have had people in my life that I have forgiven that I just don't allow in to a certain place. It's pretty surface. It's transactional, perhaps, um, but it allows me to keep the peace, and it, it and I can sleep at night knowing that this is kind of how it is, and it's not causing me more stress or anxiety. Um, but in forgiveness and in letting go of grudges, we also have to ask ourselves the question: How much water is under the bridge? Sometimes there's too much, and sometimes there there isn't a repair possible. Um, but if you really do want to repair it, you have to be willing to accept that the other person may not, and it may take more than one attempt to even try to repair it. 
um, maybe with you getting the forgiveness from you or again, vice versa, because it can't just be about what we want, what we need. It's what the other person does too. So uh, asking yourself those questions uh, that I think would be a good place to start regarding whether or not forgiveness is a possibility. Yeah, I like all that a lot. And I, I talk about all of that in my book as well. And I, I love the Buddhist quote too. And I, I think just to also add on and piggyback, it's it's also about willing to be the person making the effort mm. without expecting the other person to change necessarily. Mm. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because you can't control them. Right. They still might do those things. But if we can be the bigger person and step up, then maybe like we were talking about, about kindness, maybe they can come up to our level. Right. Uh, that is so well said. And, you know, the it's also protecting the vulnerable openings within yourself. You know, when you're creating those boundaries, you know, forgiveness, again, we were talking about the access part of it. Um, if forgiveness scares you because you're afraid that you're going to end up in the situation that you were before, you're going to be betrayed or whatever the feeling is attached to it. It's okay to say that there are going to be boundaries attached to this new version of this relationship. And it doesn't mean that those boundaries are ever communicated to the other person. You can know it. You can know how you're setting that tone. Um, but again, that's an important piece of this evaluation for yourself, to, depending on what and how you want to repair. Yeah, absolutely. And it just goes back to, like you were saying, boundaries. And just, I know we're getting tight on time, but can you just give an example of how one might set a boundary around the holidays? I was just talking to a girlfriend about this, actually, and she was saying that uh, a, a person in her family tends to really attack her kids when they come in the door and the kids are very nervous around people, even family. And it 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 makes them nervous about going to this house because they don't want, you know, to be picked up and kissed and hugged and all that, that kids want their boundaries too. So this example I'm using is I talked it through with her. She called her family and said in the way that she could use her language, my friends, like her love language, her communication language to say, you know what? Uh, we're so excited about the holiday. The kids can't wait. But right now, you know, we're trying to work on the kids making sure that they can like stand up for themselves regarding their bodies and what feels good and what doesn't. And it would be great if you could just give the kids a few minutes when they first come in to get settled and then they'll come to you. Let them come to you, though. But it will be it will you'll, it will feel so good when they do because they'll warm up as long as have some time to get acclimated. So she said it in however words, whatever her words, after we talked through it, she said it to her family. Her family was very open-minded about it. They understood. They wanted the kids to feel comfortable. She didn't attack them saying, you know, you've been doing this and it's been really upsetting my kids and we're not going to come to Christmas if you do this. She did it in a way where she got what she wanted. And that's the point get what you want from it. What's your goal of this? So you have to deliver the information in a way that is going to get you to your goal. And sometimes that's going to be you taking a minute, taking a beat and really planning what you say and saying it effectively. I love that example. Thank you for sharing it. And it just makes me think of put your ego aside, yep. right? Put yep. your ego aside because so many people would be like, well, but I want to get my point across and I want to make sure that they know what they did was wrong. But like you said, it's, it, she got the outcome she wanted right. in a way that didn't create any tension for anyone. And, and you know what? She may, the, the people, her family may learn from this circumstance with other children. They'll remember this moment. And think maybe if they see the kids a little squeamish or a little nervous, they'll think about this and think, oh, you know what? Why don't I back off and let them come to me? Maybe it will work with this kid too. There's learning in all of this, you know? So um, I, I, I hope that people can understand that going into these holidays is, you know, there are some challenges with it, but think about what your goal is. What is your goal of this gathering? And then back into it and use some of the things we talked about today, but think about what the goal is first and then work your way to that solution. I love that as a final message. Um, so thank you so much. I know you're tight on time. You've got to run to another interview. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, please let listeners know how they can get in touch with you, where they can find you, how they can buy your book. 
Well, I would be honored to connect with any of you out there. Florenceann.com is my website. My book is available there or anywhere books are sold and also social media, Florence Ann Romano. I answer every DM. Please think of me as your virtual village. Amazing. Thank you so much. And for everyone tuning in, please like, share, subscribe, help us spread the good word. If you know someone who's having a little anxiety around the holidays, send them this episode. All right. Have a beautiful rest of your day, everyone.